OK. Great. So welcome to the Neuroscience Cafe. We're really excited to have you today. Uh, so this is offered to you by the Comprehensive Neuroscience Center uh, from UAB, also known as the CNC. So we are, it's really a platform of, uh, of uh, people, neuroscientists who are interested in brain research. It's not only basic scientists, but it's also clinic, clinician, clinical researcher. So at UAB, there are neuroscientists in different schools, different departments, and um, CNC is an, an opportunity for all the neuroscientists to connect and be together and understand what we all are doing and you know, make sure that we advance science. So we have more than 500 faculty, clinicians, staff, students, and trainees and about 200 faculty. So this cafe, Neuroscience Cafe, is a, a way to let the people uh, of Alabama know about what type of research we are doing at UAB. It's really a way to uh, share uh, the wonderful work we are doing. So our mission is really to accelerate the discovery by promoting excellence in basic translational and clinical neuroscience research, education and clinical care through integrating the UAB-wide neuroscience community. And the vision is a world where the mysteries of the nervous system are solved. So I'm Adrian Latti, uh, I'm a professor and I'm the chair of the Department of Psychiatry and I'm the director of the CNC. Uh, Lucas Pozomilo, who is a professor in the Department of Neurobiology, is the co-director, and Lauren Sinsich, who is an associate professor in the Department of Optometry and Vision, Vision Science, is an associate director. So today we are really excited to uh, have Tom Houston presenting uh, this, um, this, this talk about confusion and post-confusion syndrome. Am I ever going to feel normal again? Really important question. So Dr. Houston is a physician, is a research clinician in the Department of Neurology, and he con concentrates on the diagnosis and treatment of stroke and epilepsy disorder. He uh, earned his MD degree from the Medical College of Georgia and then did his residency uh, at UAB. And he explored language recovery after stroke and also trying to understand epilepsy treatment using neuroimaging methods such as functional magnetic resonance imaging. Um, Dr. Houston has received numerous awards for excellence in research during the past few years. And he already presented at Neuroscience Cafe, so he's a vet of a cafe. And the presentation was on conclusion in football, what we know and what we're doing about it. So we're really excited about that. But before letting him uh, do his presentation, I want to tell you about the upcoming uh, Neuroscience Cafe. So in August, we will have um, Dr. Uswate and Loken speak about brain fog after COVID. Uh, in September, we will have Dr. Saplarski speaking about cannabis as medicine. In October, we'll have Amy Amara and Jane Allendorfer speaking about exercise and neural disorder. Uh, in November, uh, Dr. Pelliccioni and Soliu can bring brain science to help us understand how we should learn math. And then in December, I plan to uh, do a presentation about the state of mental health in Alabama to just let people of Alabama be aware of the problem about uh, mental health uh, resources in Alabama. So what I want to uh, make sure is to, to, for you to know how much we appreciate you coming. As we mentioned before, there will, there will be a recording of this presentation. 
and you can uh, get those recordings at our website. So you go UAB, you type, you know, UAB uh, CNC and you, you will get there. And you will, if you go to the right, la, um, you know, label, you will find us. Um, so without any uh, ado, I'm going to let Dr. Houston speak. So I'm going to stop sharing. So that's the Houston, you have the stage. Okay. All right, can everybody see the presentation? Okay. So I'm Tom Houston. It's nice to have everybody here and we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm gonna talk about concussion and post-concussion concussion syndrome. Um, and, you know, in the, the flyer, I said, you know, Patients want to know if they're ever going to be okay again. So we'll kind of go through some of this, okay? So no conflicts of interest. Um, I had some previous funding from the NIH for some of the work you'll see. Um, and I'm a part of a team that has a patent on a football helmet, but we're not going to talk about that tonight, okay? So the objectives today, we're going to talk about the definitions of concussion and post-concussion syndrome. We're gonna talk about diagnosis, treatment, and management of both acute concussion and post-concussion syndrome. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the current knowledge of, of what happens to your brain during a concussion, as well as some a little bit in the pathophysiology of post-concussive syndrome and kind of where research is going currently, okay? So what is a concussion? I like to show this slide because, you know, this is from the year 900 all the way until the 1600s. Basically, it was called commotio cerebri. Um, again, it's, you know, the, the old term for concussion. If, if you kind of take a look at this column here, um, there's different definitions. There's abnormal transient physiologic state without gross brain lesions, meaning that person bumped their head, but they don't see anything on um, if they did an autopsy or no lesions on the brain that they can detect. Um, and all the other ones, again, are basically that the, you have some sort of injury to the brain and have symptoms. And unfortunately, uh, the definition currently is not much better because we really don't have any objective measures. We have some to try to diagnose it. Um, but we'll kind of talk about what the, the running definition is now. But, you know, this has been a, a long-standing problem in people. And just recently, um, it's become a, more of a public health issue. And, and we're trying to find ways to help people. And just instead of telling people, you know, I hope you get better over time. So just so everybody's aware, um, there's classifications of traumatic brain injury. Um, you have mild, moderate, and severe. And concussion is a subset of mild traumatic brain injury. And basically what that means is that structural imaging is normal. So a CT or an MRI, you have loss of consciousness for less than 30 minutes. Um, you, you don't have alteration of awareness or confusion for more than 24 hours. Um, you don't have a period of amnesia for greater than a day. And then there's something called the Glasgow Coma Scale um, which is in the 13 to 15 range, which is ultimately not that bad, okay? And we won't talk about moderate, severe, because again, concussions are considered mild TBIs, but not all mild TBIs are necessarily uh, considered concussion. That's more of a more severe form of it. So the current evidence-based definition of concussion clinically is a change in brain function following a force to the head, which may or may not have loss of consciousness, but is identified in awake folks that have a bump to the head uh, with measures of neurologic and cognitive dysfunction. So, you know, compared to what they, they saw a thousand years ago, uh, basically the clinical definition is the same. Bump to the head, you have symptoms, there's no gross brain lesions, you may or may not lose consciousness, okay? So as far as duration and symptoms, the majority of concussion symptoms resolve within seven to 14 days, regardless of what type of injury. So like car wreck versus sports injury. 
Um, it doesn't matter. Most people, um, probably 80% or so, that number is not quite clear at this time, but um, get better by two weeks, okay? And even more than that by a month, we'll talk about that a little bit later. The most common symptoms, as you'll see, almost everybody has a headache. A lot of times it's right at the time of the injury or it could be a day or so later. Um, second most common uh, symptom is fatigue, which is vague. We don't really have a good understanding of that, but that is a common complaint. Um, and then about half of the patients have cognitive complaints, whether it's concentration, memory, um, any cognitive complaint can feel foggy. Uh, then you have dizziness, uh, vestibular complaints. They can have vertigo, room spinning, or just be off balance. That's in 40, 50%. Visual problems, especially photophobia, so sensitivity to light in up to 40%. And then other visual disturbances, so double vision, blurred vision is in about 30%. And then another main problem is mood disturbance, which can be anxiety, depression, or any psychological problem uh, that comes after the injury. So these are the main symptoms. And you know, in my personal concussion clinic, I list these symptoms and then talk to patients and almost across the board, most people have at least three or more, okay? Um, so the most prevalent symptom indicators are a con of a concussion or a diagnosis is disorientation or confusion immediately after the event, as opposed to somebody hits their head and then they, they feel a little headache for a second, but they're not disoriented, not confused. Um, if their balance is off, if they have slower reaction time within a couple of days, um, or if they complain of some short-term memory loss within a couple of days. So these are just a way to confirm that your suspicion that somebody had a concussion versus just, you know, saying, I I'm not sure this could have just been a bump to the head. Okay. But these three symptoms are, are really telling when it comes to concussion diagnosis. Um, so putting it all together, a concussion is a blow to the head with or out loss of consciousness for up to 24 hours. Usually it's much shorter than that. Normal imaging, typically it's a CT and at least one primary symptom consistent with concussion. Um, and they may not be present right at the time of injury, but will develop within a couple of days. And as far as a concussion goes, should, should resolve within seven to 14 days, okay? Um, just to give you an idea of how frequent this is, if you look at sports-related concussions, there's you know anywhere between two and four million sports-related concussions in the US each year. That is a lot of people. Um, it results in 200,000 visits to the ER. Um, for just sports related concussion, uh, the highest incident is in football, ice hockey, lacrosse, and then soccer, rugby, and wrestling. And women, the highest incidence by, by far is in soccer and then basketball and lacrosse. And of note, women performing in the same sport as men are, are twice as likely to suffer concussions in, in, in the similar sports. Um, we won't really get into why that is, but a lot of people think it has something to do with uh, neck musculature perhaps, but we don't really know that. Mainly this has to do with studies they've done in soccer and lacrosse. Okay, so diagnosis is purely clinical. Um, patients either report symptoms or a concussion is suspected by somebody on the staff. Um, in the event of loss of consciousness, they need to be assessed for uh, airway breathing and circulation, the ABCs, to make sure there's not any problems breathing, uh, to suggest that there was, you know, some very severe brain trauma, and then you make sure they don't have a cervical spine injury. Uh, and the assessment includes a standard physical exam. And then, at least for sports-related concussions, you do some sideline testing. There's a lot of modalities we'll talk about briefly. Uh, but it has to do with cognitive balance testing. Um, and there's some newer devices we won't really get into, but some has to do with eye movements as well. But essentially, it's a clinical diagnosis made by the trainer or the, the team physician. If they have a focal neurological deficit, such as numbness, tingling, weakness in one extremity or the other, they need to go to the ER and have a CT immediately. Okay. Um, 
this is some of the testing protocols they use on the sidelines. Uh, the most common is something called the SCAT. Um, the SCAT-3 is the most recent one. Um, and that is done by most college facilities now. The NFL uses a combination of the SCAT uh, test and some other things. There's also the best, was the balance error scoring system. Um, but again, ultimately it's a clinical diagnosis, but there is some test that may help um, make the determination. And uh, if you use two or more tests, it may, may help clarify the diagnosis a little bit more. But still it's an imperfect science and it comes down to, you know, do the physicians or, or uh, team trainers think the person is having ongoing symptoms and are they unsafe going back into the game, okay? Um, now, post-concussive syndrome, um, this is when symptoms persist. Um, and the clinical definition, there's the, the ICD-10, which is a billing type code, and there's also the DSM, sorry. Um, four, which is another way we use for diagnosis, mainly for psychiatric illness, but um, for the DSM, it requires three or more symptoms uh, of any of these on the left here. So for that criteria, um, any one of these, or you have to have three of any of these for a sustained period, and we'll talk about how long that period is in a minute. Um, in order to be diagnosed with post-concussive syndrome. The ICD-10 only requires, uh, it also requires three, um, but the DSM is actually three months of symptoms, which is also a little bit long in my opinion, but three months, three symptoms for DSM, ICD-10, um, it's just three or more symptoms listed. Um, and as, you, as you'll see here, the DSM includes um, some personality changes, apathy, or um, mental health changes and anxiety and depression that's not in the ICD-10. I think this is a better um, uh, group of symptoms to include because most patients have some sort of psychological complaint. Okay. So again, everybody agrees that you probably need three or more for these diagnoses, but I'll show you that's not entirely true, but this is the way that uh, it's currently coded. Okay, and as you see, all the symptoms I talked about are very common. Um, the newly proposed definition is three of any of these for more than a month. So there's a lot of these, you know, I mean, stomach ache. I don't know about that. But again, it's these main symptoms up top. They just add a lot of um, specific type of psychiatric, psychological uh, issues and more severe symptoms, but in the newly proposed definition, it's just greater than a month. Okay. So putting it all together for the definition of post-concussive syndrome, a history of concussion, obviously, um, greater than one ICD-10 or DCSM-4 symptom for at least 14 days to one month. Um, and these symptoms right here are what you want to look for. Okay. So again, one month is kind of the proposed definition, but for working diagnoses, we go from two weeks to one month, okay? Um, so this is a, just a study that looked at the prevalence of post-concussive syndrome in concussion patients. Uh, and there was 284 patients, two thirds were from sports or recreation activities. And this is over a long time period. So 221, that's almost 80% of patients ended up being diagnosed with PCS. And this was based on three symptoms for one month, okay? So if you use that definition, it includes a lot more people, um, you know, 80% versus, you know, I said that at the beginning that 70 or 80% actually get over their symptoms in a few weeks. Um, this study kind of looks at it a different way. And these were in younger people. And actually the average number of symptoms was eight. And the mean duration here was seven months. So this kind of gives a bleak picture of, of post-concussive syndrome. Um, and it is, a, it is a problem. And if you don't try to intervene earlier, it can be sustained. Okay. Now this is, they did a survey of 600 physicians and asked them 
how do you diagnose post-concussive syndrome? And as you see here, most um, said after a month to three months, but you also see, you know, the top two are within 14 days to one month, okay? And this is clinically what physicians do. Uh, and this is essentially what I go by as well. I, I mostly see patients that are at least a month in anyway, um, but, but after two weeks, you know, or greater than a month um, is, is what the working definition of, of PCS is. And actually, most providers only require one symptom for the diagnosis of PCS. If you see, this is the, a study of a lot of doctors as well. So one symptom for a month, they put the diagnosis code as post-concussive syndrome, okay? Um, this is the post-concussive symptom score. Um, I use something similar in my clinic, but it helps you keep up with how patients are doing. Um, it's very simple. You can print it out online. Basically, they rate their symptoms themselves or, of all these symptoms. And then you put the baseline, you know, the first visit that you see them, you get a score. And then you see how, how they do with each subsequent visit to see if they're improving. Um, and this is important because, you know, if you use this, um, I didn't put that in there, but um, ultimately this helps prevent, uh, predict who's going to develop post-concussive syndrome. So the higher the score, the higher likelihood you are um, to have sustained symptoms. Um, and that's important because there are treatments which we'll talk about and you need to get more aggressive about that earlier when their symptom score is high versus if they have a mild headache um, you may want to just see if it, you know, kind of goes away on its own, but if they have a myriad of symptoms that are severe, you need to step in early because that seems to help improve long-term prognosis. Um, so some things that I do once somebody comes to me with post-concussive syndrome, um, if they're having visual problems, whether it's blurry vision, double vision, or photophobia, I send them to Dr. Weiss. Um, who is a terrific optometrist at, at Callahan. And she has a specialized clinic called the MTBI EYE clinic on Friday mornings. And they do very specific testing to, to see if there's visual dysfunction. And honestly, sometimes when patients don't even have uh, subjective complaints of vision problems, they actually have eye muscle dysfunction which when they try to read causes problems, it gives them headaches. And when you find that, um, you can actually intervene. Um, and some, these are some of the, the diagnoses that she makes. So there's something called convergence insufficiency where the eyes come together, um, inability to accommodate and psychotic dysfunction, which is kind of moving your eyes back and forth. There can be problems with this after concussion that may not be evident on just a regular physical exam. Um, but she can help identify objective problems that are treatable. And like I said, dysfunction in, eye, uh, in vision and eye movement can cause problems with other symptoms. So I, I have an algorithm I'll show at the end, but one of those is sending them to Dr. Weiss. And she's really, really good at what she does. Um, and this is just showing a study they did in children. And you can see that in multiple studies here, you know, in several from 30 to 50% had some sort of eye movement insufficiency problem and accommodative insufficiencies up to word of 50%. So eye problems are common. You need to test for it uh, when somebody has post-concussive syndrome if they have visual complaints and sometimes when they don't have visual complaints. Um, vestibular testing. So Dr. Weiss can sometimes say, I think your eyes are fine, but there's something wrong with your vestibular system. And so we have this fancy chair at UAB that they can get in, they spin you around, they measure your eye movements. Um, and this can actually be used to uh, find objective evidence of vestibular dysfunction um, for several reasons. One, it could be that your dizziness is um, not related to eye movement problems, but is actually vestibular. Um, and we need to get you into vestibular therapy ASAP. Um, it also uh, tests the peripheral vestibular system which, you know, sometimes when you get a hit to the head, it dislodges some crystals in your ear, which causes peripheral vertigo, 
which is treated much differently than central vertigo, which we think through, at least through some of the research I did, that it's actually deep down in the brain. And so besides therapy, there's not a treatment, but for peripheral, you see an ENT, they do certain maneuvers that may help with that, okay? So treatment overview, um, successful treatment of a post-concussive syndrome involves a detail. Did I take the headache out of there? Okay. Um, I can talk about that in just a second. Uh, you need to make early post-concussive management with assessment and recognition of early complications. You need to educate people about symptoms they may have. Um, you can make recommendations for some activity modifications and close follow-up. Um, and as far as uh, post-concussive headaches go, I didn't put this in there, but essentially it's medications and I prescribe those. Um, and uh, usually you use the same treatments you use for migraine. Sometimes you have to get um, more aggressive with things like Botox. Um, but I can answer some questions about that specifically after the talk is over. I thought that I left that. Okay, here it is. Sorry. I don't know why that slide came in there. Post-traumatic headache um, typically develops within seven days. It's considered delayed if onset is after a week. If greater than three months, it's considered chronic. Um, the phenotype, so the type of headache is most commonly migrainous. And then there's another fourth of folks that have probable migraine. Um, and risk factors for persistent post-traumatic headache or, or female gender uh, prior his, in a prior history of headache, especially migraine. Um, in kids, actually, if you give them NSAIDs, so ibuprofen, um, early with the headache, they actually return to school quicker. So that was just one study we looked at. Um, so this is what I was talking about medication. So uh, the main medication I use is something called amitriptyline. It's what we call a tricyclic antidepressant. Don't really use it too much for depression anymore, uh, but it works great for headaches. That's usually my first go-to. Give it at night. It allows people to sleep too may help mood a little bit. That's the, the good one. And it has about 30% responder rate. Uh, more aggressive therapy is something called Topamax, which is a seizure drug, but it has a lot of side effects. But as you can see, almost 50% of people get better. And the other ones are blood pressure medicine and then another seizure medicine. But these two are typically what I go to and people normally do better. Now, if they have a history of migraine, it's much more complicated. And these are the other interventions I was talking about. If you can't control it with meds, you have to do um, Botox. You can give them steroid injections back of the neck. Um, sometimes if they actually have neck problems from a wreck that's causing the headache, they can, um, they can do physical therapy that may help with that. Um, and these newer agents, you've probably seen them on TV that they use for refractory migraine. Not sure if they work in post-concussive headache, but if it is migrainous, then maybe. I haven't used them yet, but probably will in the future. Um, this is showing another treatment, so vestibular rehab. So when we find that somebody has vestibular dysfunction, um, I send them to Brian King at Spain Rehab, and he is very good at what he does. Um, and people actually get way better. And this is just showing that um, basically their scales of severity all go down after therapy. You can do that in community too. Most physical therapy places has somebody that will do vestibular therapy, that, but that's the only treatment for central vertigo. And the earlier do it, you do it, the better people are. Um, as I talked about with Dr. Weiss, these are the therapies that um, she offers. Um, so there's vision therapy, which works on eye movements, but she also has these very specialized glasses um, that can help um, with photophobia and also for training your eyes back to the way they were before the concussion. And so that's why I send people to her and then she uh, recommends vision therapy sometimes. It, and a lot of it has to do with uh, home exercises you can do yourself. Um, if somebody has cognitive complaints that are severe, I send them to see Dr. Hollis at Spain Rehab. And he does, this is just an example of uh, the neuropsych testing that he does. He comes back and tells me what he thinks. 
most of the time people are normal and he tells me that he thinks that it's all the other symptoms that are affecting their daily life that are messing with concentration um, and memory actually because their scores are normal but we go ahead and do this too it's important to have this information um, emotional disturbance so anxiety depression things like that um, Zoloft, Celexa, and actually Ritalin sometimes with attention problems are effective for post-TBI depression. Um, I have one patient that's on methylphenidate that's Ritalin. Um, you can see here that anxiety disorders and PTSD from the event are significant contributors, contributors to prolonged symptoms and should be treated aggressively. Um, and there are really few studies to guide pharmacological treatment of irritability after MTBI, but the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors such as Celexa, Effexor, um, Prozac, things like that are generally tried first before mood stabilizers. And I do use these fairly frequently when somebody has a, a prominent anxiety component, especially if their neuropsych testing shows that they're actually cognitively normal, but they have anxiety so bad they can't concentrate. This is just a little brief study, looks at Zoloft versus placebo for post-TBI uh, depression. So a little bit more benefit. So kind of in conclusion, this is my treatment algorithm that I have come up with. So you have a concussion, you have these hallmark symptoms and we treat each symptom individually um, and attempt to uh, try to, you know, keep the, the symptoms from snowballing because the worse one symptom get, it makes everything worse. So you can see here, visual symptoms, symptoms of Dr. Weiss, sometimes actually patients complain of double vision and it's actually functional. So they don't actually have double vision, but you can uh, do some behavioral therapies that can help with that. Vestibular symptoms, we send them to vestibular therapy. Cognitive symptoms, they go to neuropsych testing, then possible meds. Um, also, counseling can help with this. And then mood symptoms, we try SSRIs and also counseling. And headaches is symptomatic treatment. Okay. So, just a, a little bit about the pathophysiology of um, concussion. We think that there's some inflammatory component. Your brain gets shaken. And there's some evidence to suggest that the white matter is effective as well as the deep, uh, deep matter structures. Um, and so all this inflammation causes free radical production, and it can trigger what we call axonal problems, um, which are in the white matter, and uh, can affect cognition. That's kind of the highways of information. Um, and sometimes this neuroinflammation causes um, an accumulation of inflammatory agents, which can cause um, some swelling and things like that. Ultimately, we don't really know, but we do think there is an inflammatory component deep in the brain, not necessarily in the cortex where the kind of the thinking happens where the neurons or, or brain cells are located. Um, so, where is the damage actually occurring? This is a study that we did here. Um, we found some abnormalities in the white matter tracks. You can kind of see these are, um, these are the tracks of the brain that we do modeling with. Um, this is actually one of the concussion patient's brains. But these black areas are white matter tracks where we found some abnormalities on fancy MRI imaging that looks at basically how water flows through the brain. And these are long tracks and, you know, they have specific functions and language and memory and cognition. Um, and this study actually um, confirmed um, some findings previously in, in large studies, especially in, in sports athletes. So this is just showing that the white matter kind of deep down in the brain uh, can be affected uh, by concussion because that area is tethered to the spine and it doesn't rotate as much as the white matter in the cortex when there's an injury, is what we think anyway. Um, this is actually a person that we did a scan on, and what you're looking at here is a side view of the brain. This red is fluid, 
This is the ventricle that's supposed to have fluid in. But if you look, this is a guy preseason and then post concussive. And you see all this red back here in the, we call it the occipital, but the posterior part of the brain. There's a lot of edema and swelling back there. Now, this was just one case, but this guy had significant symptoms. Um, and this, this is called nodi imaging. It's super fancy. It takes a supercomputer to run the analysis. Um, but this was some objective evidence that we do see some, um, some edema or swelling. We don't know where it comes from. Is it cells leaking? Is it axon, axons breaking? Um, but this is an example of some of the research we did here, which was clear evidence that there's some fluid buildup there. Now, study that's hopefully going to get published uh, in the Journal of Neurosurgery in the next few months, but we did that fancy imaging on uh, a group of players that had preseason MRI and then post-concussive MRI, and we found these abnormalities. This is the thalamus. So this is a deep brain structure that has tons of inputs um, through, from the spine and brain stem that kind of project up to the cortex. A lot of sensory input, a lot of vision input, a lot of vestibular input. And we found some, some areas of abnormalities where there's a fluid shift here in these deep brain structures. And this was not necessarily our hypothesis, but we think it makes sense because that area of the brain, again, um, from a physics standpoint, it doesn't have much sheer um, ability. It doesn't stretch much. So if you turn it or move it, um, it can cause some disruption in that area. And, and like I said, this has connections all over the brain and into the brainstem and, and spinal cord. So we did find some abnormalities here, which may help to explain at least the vestibular vertigo spinny sensations, as well as some visual problems during concussions and potentially some of the cognitive complaints. The thalamus itself is a very complex organ of the brain. Um, but again, this study does help shed a little bit of light on where the problem might be. And you can see here, this is a picture of the thalamus and all these vestibular nuclei. So all these connections are kind of, you know, all throughout the thalamus, but also in the area where we found those abnormalities. And so this could be a reason, at least in this setting for, for vestibular problems that we can't explain from a peripheral or ear canal standpoint. And this is just something cool. So I also do epilepsy and we insert these electrodes into people's brains to try to figure out where their seizures are coming from. And I have a colleague that is doing a research study where we actually advance one of the electrodes into the thalamus, into the anterior thalamus. And this is a showing a picture of that. And we can stimulate these electrodes with a, a current. We have a little box that does it. And actually in one patient, um, we were able to produce a vestibular and spinny sensation response, which really hadn't been documented before. Um, so we weren't planning to see this, but it helped kind of confirm some of my sus suspicion, at least for the, the vertigo uh, in concussion, that maybe it is a deep brain problem. So in conclusion, to kind of finish up, concussion is a clinical diagnosis with some help from some objective testing, especially uh, sideline testing. Sy typically symptoms resolve spontaneously within two weeks to one month. After that, it's considered post-concussive syndrome. Um, post-concussive syndrome is common and disabling that affects a substantial number of children and adults. Um, you need to use a multimodal assessment and also multimodal treatments uh, to help improve long-term outcomes and get patients back to themselves quicker. Um, at least from my experience, earlier intervention may help prevent prolonged persistent symptoms. So fixing vertigo, getting headaches under control, treating anxiety early may help them get better quicker. And lastly, the thalamus and some of its white matter, those information highways that connect up to the cortex <clears throat> may be involved. And although there's not really a therapeutic target, it, you know, it's important to understand why people are getting these, this myriad of symptoms. 
these are uh, the people that I've done research with in the past. Uh, you can take a look at that. It's a, it's a very group effort uh, to get all this done. And that's my family and cats. And that's it. Okay, thank you very much, Tom, uh, Dr. Houston. Uh, we can open, you know, the, the audience for discussion. Maybe if you uh, want to stop sharing, we can all look at each other okay. and see who would like to ask a question. Uh, if you can raise a hand or you can put a, a question in the chat if you don't want, um, but you're welcome to uh, unmute mute yourself and speak up. Hi, Dr. Halston. Hey there. Hi, hi um, my name is Jason Weiss. I was just curious about the um, incidence of photophobia with people with MTBI. Um, do, have you noticed or, or found clinically that there are particular types of lighting that um, these individuals are more sensitive to, like you know, indoor fluorescent lighting, certain wavelengths, and what is your thoughts on the, in terms of the filters, you know, they used to talk about specific like rose colored filtration. Is, is that still something that you guys use therapeutically or have you noticed any kind of improvement with those types of uh, interventions? Yeah, so sure. So yeah, I think fluorescent, uh, you know, there's this flickering, we can't really recognize um, at least uh, uh, subjectively, but it, it does affect your eyes. Most people say that you know, it is fluorescence, um, bright lights, not a specific type, um, but yeah, fluorescence just in general, you know, if they're in a department store or Walmart or whatever, that seems to bother them more. Um, and actually filters, and Dr. Weiss honestly knows more about this than I do, um, but she has specialized filters that she uses all the time that really helps. You know, she uses a lot of transition lens as well so that you know, a, a lot of times these patients, they have blurred vision, they don't know it. And actually their visual acuity has changed. So she gives them glasses, but then the transition glasses, I don't know exactly what filters they use. I think it's polarized, but um, it does seem to help tremendously. Um, but as far as the particular filters, I'm not sure. Um, but it does help people. Uh, and that's why I send them to Dr. Weiss and just let her check them out and, and do what she needs to do. It, I also noticed that screens are much worse for photophobia. Um, and I don't know why that is. It could be the, the rate um, or the wavelengths that you're seeing on the screens. You know, again, we, don't, we can't recognize it unless you slow it down. Um, but whatever the refresh rate is seems to, to make people worse, especially phones and computers. You know, I have a lot of patients that, uh, they can't work because they can't stare at the screen because they get a headache, you know? And so that's a real issue, but the glasses do help with that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Houston, I have a question. Uh, okay. so it looks like it's really important for people to get to be seen and evaluated quickly. Right. So we are very lucky at UAB Neurology. There's, there's this specialized clinic it, what's the access? Can you get, a, a, you know, an appointment quickly? So unfortunately, I'm the only person in Birmingham that I know of, especially at UAB, that does post-concussive work kind of specifically. So I kind of handle the complex cases. I have two clinic days a month <laughs> scheduled for concussion, so it's tough. Um, most sports medicine providers or family medicine doctors can at least evaluate you within a couple of weeks and try to predict, you know, if you're going to, if you have a high severity score and then kind of get you in the list to see me. Um, I'd like to have more clinics. I just currently have to do more epilepsy. So that's a problem. I'm trying to recruit some young faculty people to help me out, but it, it's a problem, you know, because community neurologists, they don't have kind of the algorithm that I do and the resources that really seem to work because I send them to optometry, vestibular therapy, neuropsych, all in one go, you know, and that seems to help. So access is limited, unfortunately. Yeah. 
There's a, there's a question in the chat. Dr. Houston, can you see that? I this, can. This is from a so, yeah, if, if it's not chronic, um, would I recommend a child return to sports? If it's the first one and they're asymptomatic after a couple of weeks, it's probably okay. They do not need to go back to return to play, especially contact sport, if they're having any symptoms. Uh, let's see. There are two questions. There's, um, you see that? You have to yeah. scroll down. Yeah. So do I think chronic microglial activation contributing to PCS? Um, probably, you know, I have some patients that had a wreck or something like that five or six years ago and they're still symptomatic. So there has to be some ongoing process. It's not, I don't think there's permanent damage that's been done because if I start to treat them, they tend to get better even after this time period. So I think there is an inflammatory compart, uh, component. And uh, yeah, I would like to talk to Dr. Younger about what he's doing. So you can, I'll put my email in the chat uh, if you want to email me. Um, I have a question. Um, you said that you have done studies or you, you showed us studies from young children, but babies and little kids get concussions. And how do you, you can't use the same scoring, can you, for, um, they can't report to you. Yeah, so the good news is they, um, you can't use the post-concussion symptom uh, scale, um, but they have a comprehensive concussion clinic at Children's at UAB that's run by neurosurgery, and they have all the resources I do. Um, and they have different ways of kind of uh, scaling their symptoms. You know, it could be from parents reporting or, or things like that, but that's a great, um, that was actually... I use some of my, their knowledge to start my clinic, actually. But that's a great resource. They get kids in quick. Um, so that's something that uh, should be utilized at Children's for sure. Yeah, but it can be difficult, especially, you know, super young kids is tough. And I, I'm mainly an adult neurologist, but, you know, hopefully you, you hope that kids that can't uh, uh intelligently talk about their symptoms it, it's an issue but that's why they they can do vision testing and things like that in kids as well thanks uh return to school should the academic program be attenuated in some way um if they're symptomatic from an attention standpoint um i usually write letters i mean i have kids in college that um, have an injury can't process and so i ask the facility to give them Special accommodations uh, could be increased time for test, uh, things like that, especially you can do neuropsych testing in kids too, not super young kids, but if they have objective evidence of those problems, then you have something to show the staff as well. Um, you don't want to push somebody back into a high stress environment if they're still symptomatic. Um, so I think it's reasonable, especially for kids now, screen time is a problem. You know, they're looking at a computer all day. That may need to be limited as well. Okay. Short question, is, is Kathy Weiss's clinic really in Callahan? I thought it was either an optometry or a joint with children's. I think it's in Callahan. Okay, I'll have to check with him, with her. Yeah. yeah, I'm pretty sure. That's where, because, you know, they're on a different system. I have to, I can't send referrals through our electronic medical records. So, I mean, that's where the optometry clinic is. I don't, I, I, she may do a separate one at Children's too. I'm not sure. She is in the clinic at UAB Eye Care. Yeah. Well, that's optometry, not Callahan. Okay, I'm sorry. Not Callahan High Sp Hospital. Callahan's ophthalmology, the one you can't spell. Right, right, right. right. He's in the one you can spell. Right. Okay. Um, I can say in, for a, a classroom setting, one of the things we do, um, I teach in the Department of Occupational Therapy. Um, we've had a couple of students in the last few years who've had post-concussive syndrome, and we have got special uh, filters that we've purchased that are magnetic that we put over the overhead lighting in the course in the classrooms. 
um, it seemed to be beneficial to those students. And the other students seemed to appreciate it too. Um, it actually kind of evolved into a, a research study in terms of looking at that um, in terms of a classroom. But that's one way we addressed that in our classrooms was to adjust the lighting in the space, uh, make it a little harsh for them. Yeah, that's it. I, I've never heard of that. That's great. So, Dr. Houston, can you tell us what is being done uh, for uh, Atlet? You know, I mean, the, the number you, are, you, you have shown are just pretty impressive. The number of young people get, you know, into conclusion. So right. it, what is being done for that? You know, it's- so in, Do you want to know specifically about athletics or? Yeah, well, you know, you show a number, of, you know, young Right, people. so sports-wise- Sports-wise, right. <laughs> you know, basically what has happened is that um, they cracked down a little bit on diagnosing earlier and not pushing people to return to play. Um, so ultimately, you know, what I initially wanted to do was to try to prevent concussions in football by technology. But that doesn't seem to be where they put the money. now. So it's more about correctly diagnosing it and not pushing back people into play where they could get a second hit, which would increase inflammation and, and decrease outcomes. Um, there are, you know, I go to the concussion uh, some, or the, the, the national conference every year, and there's a lot of new devices they have sometimes that measure eye movements that are more objective, but the data is still not 100% on that. There's some work that people do with iPads to try to have some objective measures because it's tough, you know, especially in college athletics, because there's so much money involved in, you know, if somebody's in the national championship game and they bump their head, but they say they're not having symptoms, but they are, and they go back, you know, that's a huge issue. And it's not just, you know, on the player or the team physician, you've got all these, uh, these people that are trying to weigh in. And we really need some objective findings where you can stick somebody somewhere, do the test and say, you're done. You know, so they're trying to get better about that. Coaches are becoming more aware of this could be a long-term issue if you if you push players. So from that standpoint, that's kind of what they're doing to try to help long-term outcomes. But prevention-wise, uh, reducing contact and practice has helped some. You know, and younger kids, they wear, especially in football, they wear these giant, like, cushions on their head. That's a different issue. It may make their head heavy, but... They're trying, but it seems like we've reached this plateau and everybody's kind of happy to push it under the rug that people are still getting their heads bashed constantly. And it's probably underreported still. And we're just not doing enough, in my opinion, from a technology standpoint uh, to help prevent some of this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have more questions? You can unmute or you can put it on the, ch the chat. Yeah. Looks like we, we are arriving at, at the end. There's no more question. I don't see anything on the chat. So Dr. Houston, thank you so much for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Yeah. And excellent question from uh, the public. So uh, I think this is a very important matter and we are really lucky at UAB to have people like you doing this kind of clinical work and research. Okay. And also it looks like I missed one question to Janet Standard, uh, which I can answer. Um, about headaches. Okay. So they're ongoing. Um, yeah, you know, for if it's just post-traumatic headache, uh, you can try a, um, a local neurologist or your primary care doctor um, to start a preventative medication that you take every day for the headaches. Um, they don't have a tremendous amount of side effects. They're well tolerated and you don't have to be on them forever. But if they're going on since May, um, I would go on a prophylactic medication such as amitriptyline. I can tell um, you has anybody mentioned uh, meditation as far as uh, helping with headaches? And I think I need to.
You we can't hear you. See if you're muted. Wrong computer. <laughs> Sorry. I've got two computers. One of them has a mic and one doesn't. Let me turn off the other one. Uh, uh, mic. Crap. There. Is that better? <laughs> Uh, my question is, uh, have we done any studies as far as using meditation to help with headaches with concussions? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, certainly, you know, there's, there's an obvious psychological overlay to a lot of people, especially chronic headaches. So, you know, if somebody came to me and said they wanted to try that, I would be all for it. You know, it's a non-medical treatment, but as far as studies for specifically post-traumatic headache and meditation, I am not sure if there's data on that or not. It wouldn't hurt, <laughs> you know? So, and that, you know, that would help a lot with some of the, you know, I send all these people to counseling too, for a lot of different reasons, but, you know, helping yourself with that type of uh, intervention, I think is, would help for sure. Okay, there's another question. What about minocycline for headaches, amantadine for cognitive issues? So I'm not sure about minocycline for headaches. Um, amantadine, so the last concussion conference I went to, there was a study that said that amantadine can actually be used for headaches. Um, I've tried it in one patient. It didn't do anything. I haven't tried it for cognitive issues, but if Miss Coleman, if you think that will work, I will try it. <laughs> I know, you know, they use amantadine a lot in, in more severe traumatic brain injury. Um, I mean, I, I see, you know, because I'm in epilepsy, these post-traumatic epilepsy patients that have had a TBI, almost all of them come to me on amantadine. Um, I haven't tried it in, you know, concussion, which is a mild TBI, but um, it may be worth looking at. I'll actually, I don't know of any data on cognitive um, treatments with amantadine and mild TBI, but that's something I can look into as well. But thanks for bringing that up. My son's psychiatrist. Okay. Thanks for that. Okay. Well, I think we are coming at... Um, the end of this uh, presentation. So again, Dr. Houston, thank you very much. And thank you for the wonderful questions. And then we'll see you in a month. Uh, so have a great evening. Okay. Thanks uh, to everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>